Hey now, and welcome to the Daniel Baldwin Show with... Jamie Andrews, good morning. Jamie Andrews. (sighs) 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 We are our own crowd. The crowd is going wild. The crowd is going wild. Thanks, everybody. You're too kind. I know, I know. You have to dodge them when you come in. I walk by and they look over my shoulder to see if Jamie's coming. (laughs) Uh, and, they, and they don't, they don't, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Hey, your stuff's funny. Yeah, great. Where's Jamie? Um, so, hey, what's He's going lying. on? He's lying. He's how, lying. How was your week? Oh, it was a great week. I'm uh, pretty excited about stuff going on. I was looking forward to getting in front of the mic with you today. How's the, how's the book? Oh, my God. That has been really funny. I put out this book, The Brink, and it's about my childhood, really, and teenage years, which were a bit crazy. And I have heard from two people that there's a group of people on Long Island that have gotten my book and they're getting together and trying to decode it and figure out who is who. <laughs> oh, like figure out who, oh, cause you used other names to protect the innocent. Yeah. I changed everybody's names. And then <sighs> I heard from my first love and he was like, just so you know, I haven't read it yet, but just so you know, there's things I could say too, and it might hurt your friendships. I'm like, what is this petty ass stuff you're peddling? I don't know what he's talking about. And, he's, and I and, don't and, care to know. And That's he's, not true. I want to know. And he's mentioned uh, by it, with an alias. Yeah. He's talked, uh, is he talked about a lot? Oh yeah. He was a major part of my life. Mm. And, and my husband was like, he's talked about very favorably. And I'm like, oh, well, there is this. And, oh yeah. So he he may not like it. See, I think it would have been more fun if you had consulted me before you did this book. I think you should have. If you're going to do another one, you need to consult me because we could have called the guy Brad Tit. You know, what I mean, like we could <laughs> we could have we could have insinuated that he was really Brad Pitt when he was younger, and then people would have gone nuts. Okay, they, I see. This this could have done something for me with sales for sure. Yeah, Ar- Armand Chianti. You know, what I mean, like we could have just continued on and all made up all these names. Who's Armand Chianti supposed to be? Armand Desanti. Oh come on! <laughs> he could have been the old. That's a deep cut. That's that, a, that deep was cut, a deep Daniel. cut, Daniel. <laughs> that was a deep cut. But I was I was going with it. I was going. We got John Ashton coming up later. Very excited. Uh, yeah, we're really excited to have John on the show. I mean, I, and I didn't realize, uh, and I'll save this when John gets on. But I've done four movies with John. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I rival Eddie Murphy in the Beverly Hills Cop ones because I think there was, if I remember correctly, John did one and two, and I think three, they kept delaying him or something. I'm going to have to ask him about this, but he was delayed for a while, and he... um um We... Wow, you just got man. That's exciting. You got yeah, man yeah. by Kiki. Manipulate me as needed. Kiki Eardrum. Um. So anyway, uh, uh, I think three, they waited too long and then he's contractually obligated to do so. I remember that whole buzz going around thinking, how are they going to do this without John? He's such a pivotal yeah. part. Uh, um, yeah, we're going to have to ask him about that because four is coming out. So the, the boys are all much older now and they're doing Beverly Hills Cop 4. So I don't know the storyline or what John's willing to give up, but I'm very interested. And we're going to talk about uh, the Screen Actors Guild strike and that... Uh, uh, AI and lots of stuff that I know is right up your alley because that was part of Jamie's jam previously to yep. this show. Just what I said was going to be a problem was a problem with everyone. Not saying I'm psychic, just saying I know. Uh, I was right there with you and tweeted about the fact that this deal is not going to cover what we really wanted it mm-hmm. to cover. It, 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 the sides were too far apart um, in the last yeah. like kind of update, and I think Franny and and some of those people there were under the gun to make it happen. Um, but we didn't get what we wanted. It's, it's a, it's a crappy deal. So I'm not shocked at all. actually. Oh no, they're, <laughs> they're absolutely planning to scan people and use them in perpetuity mm-hmm. and whether they get paid for one day for doing that. Pe- I've heard people say that extras are going or background art artists are going to be completely eliminated within 20 to 30 years. Oh, 20 to 30 years. What are you talking? They'll be eliminated you think in the next, <laughs> less than a decade. If you can duplicate, so so if these machines can make faces uh, based on um, probability factors, so they don't look, they're generically faces, mm-hmm. but you're not going to have to pay anybody. You made oh. them. They're computer enhanced. So, um, yeah, you're, watch. It's going to be terrible. Um, so your husband went away. 
he did. and he went to the reunion and now he's back. What was the update? He met the old girlfriend. He was he drinking met, with the boys. What went down? He met three old girlfriends. Ooh, three. Of varying importance. Um <laughs> and yeah, I'm not intimidated by this. I love being friends with my exes. Uh, one of them is coming on a cruise with us at the end of the year because Kurt and him get along like crazy. So these things don't bother me at all. You guys are very progressive. We're I'm just going to say, You're very progressive. We are. I think the the exposure to Los Angeles has definitely changed you. We have so many friends <laughs> that are polyamorous and transgender. Like we have a whole spectrum of friends, and you know, I think that just makes life better. So being open to other experiences, he goes, no jealousy. He goes, he comes home and he tells you, Oh, I saw Allison, Gwendolyn and Madeline. And you know, everyone's doing great. Everything's good. My phone is making noises. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, um, sounds like an Amber alert or something. It's, it's an alert for my blood sugar. Actually. Oh, really? So let's, okay. take, let's take a look at what it says. My blood sugar right now is 253 which is about 100 points over what it should be. Oh, great. Um, what do we do? Do we need to shoot you up with something? Woo, woo, woo. No, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. Um, okay, so so no news, no no great news, nothing well, stunning. Well, he did say he wish I'd come because he talked about me the whole time, which oh, is totally adorable. Nice cover. I like it. <laughs> I like it. No, I believe him. Nice cover. He does that. He's like my manager. He's He does the best PR for me that I've ever had. That's funny because I've never, you know, I've been in relationships with other actresses and everything. And what's really cool about my relationship with my wife now is she has nothing, no desire. She won't even FaceTime me sometimes and be on camera. I, I've gotten to grow and know the roof of her office. And I say to her, like, are you going to turn the camera on you so I can see you? And she's like, I'm working. So, and I know when she says that, that she's on a deadline and that she's really paying no attention to what I'm saying. That That's her nice way of saying to me, shut up. Why are you calling? Um, but then I, I've mentioned to her that it bothers me over, over, oh, know, yeah. over time that my, and, and so now she, she tilts, it looks at me really quick to make sure she acknowledges me and then goes, okay, I got to go work. <laughs> you know? Don't but you I, think it's great to have a woman in your life who's doing her own thing and you can be independent of each other and still enjoy each other and come together when one of the things that attracted to me attracted me to her immediately was how independent she is you mm -hmm. know, so she's you know um uh, self-made uh you know went to spellman and then uh notre dame law school wow. um she's an attorney of a powerful attorney yes um and she you know has big big clients well and she doesn't she'll say what do you think of blah blah and <clears throat> i'll chime in with my opinion She'll say, okay, great. She tells me all the time I should have been a lawyer. And I said, let's open huh. Baldwin and Baldwin. I'll go to like nighttime law school. That's so cute. I, yeah, just because. Or it would be a great sitcom. So either way. Come and knock or on rea door. Or reality show. Well, I don't think I have her smarts for that. Like she can go through. I'm, I'm pretty smart at certain things. But I have to. I'm one of those at my age now where I have to be interested in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in going into court and crushing someone you know, in front of a jury performing, but I'm not interested. She's, you know, she can go through, like she'll say numbers to me that I'll go, can that really be true? Uh, she'll say, oh, I have 3,400 documents to go through this weekend. And, go, oh. and, and she'll go through 3,400 yeah. documents for a partner to try to catch that one thing. And then she's got to look up like legal precedents. I mean, it's a lot of like heavy research stuff yeah. that she'll do. I wouldn't and, like and that And she's either. a detail, you know, details ah look here you know and i'll be like oh what does that mean you know and, and so she'll explain it to me but i think the great thing about it is we're the type of couple that likes to just go to the store together like that to us we go sometimes we go and walk our son around the store to buy like one thing but we'll walk down each aisle because all we do is talk and hang out when we do it and then we'll go, we'll buy almost nothing you know, because uh, uh, we're there, we'll get the Gatorade zeros and we'll get something. For, That's so cute. For the, it is. It, it, actually, we have this great desire to be with each other, which is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I usually was looking for a way to get out, you know, <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't. Well, how did you two meet? I haven't asked you that yet. We met at Kroger. Oh, it's, so going back to the supermarket is like revisiting your first encounter. Well, now, now see, she's going to probably want to be on to defend herself for this because... 
um, when we met at Kroger in Sandy Springs, um, I lived in Sandy Springs. She lived like way, like almost downtown. And so the question became later, why were you in Sandy Springs going to Kroger at like seven o'clock at night? To meet you. I, I said you were man shopping. Tell the truth. <laughs> you were going into one of the more affluent better, areas. Better men in Sandy Springs, she, sure. She was man shopping. I was strolling down aisle four. I was on special. Uh, they, they were, everything must go sale. You know, it, was, it was one of those, you know, when they have the rack. Dented box. No, 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 I don't think it was dented box. I think it was one of those where it's about to expire. So they're okay. letting it go. It's, it's a so special funny. for the okay. week. At my age, I was about to expire compared to her. So, so she took that into consideration. I will say that I rolled up in a 2023 convertible Rolls Royce. And so she um, walked by. We definitely made eye contact with each other. Like I was like, oh, and she's so good looking that, I was kind of like, I clocked it, you know, but I didn't want to overdo it. So we walk around. Then I saw her down another aisle and I thought, should I go by her again? Or is that going to just look so obvious? So I didn't do anything about it. Um, and I went out to the car and she comes out who she's parked right next to me. Whoa, so she, she, I, I'm sure she clocks the car, you know, and, and, and then me and I'm like, Hey, what's up? I go, Did, you know, but when I start to, and I literally got to a point where I went, did that seem weird to you when we walked by each other? Cause I really felt this. She goes, no, I felt it too. And I said, okay. That now, gives me the chill. Where we differ in the story is I tell people that she walked out and she did not have any bags in her cart. So she came out to make sure I didn't get away. And so she goes, "You thought that's ridiculous. Of course I had bags. I put them in the trunk. No, you didn't. You came out because you wanted to see before I went. You came, you were stalking. You came out and stalked me out. And you, you, you made sure that you found. And she goes, you are such a loser. That's not what happened. <laughs> so we have fun telling the story to other people because she looks and just, you know, she gives that look up with her eyes like, He's, oh, Spoon, he's gone. His ego is way out of control right now. So anyway, uh, the rest is history. Um, we were dating. I called her right away. We exchanged numbers. I called her the next day. We were together, hanging out, you know, spending time with each other within a week. And um, I think it was less than three weeks. And that was it. I, I was done. I knew. I don't think she knew as fast as I knew. But yeah. I knew. Oh, swoon. Yeah, I did. I knew. So you're a romantic. Yeah. You know, I mean, you want all those things. Um, you've learned, and I've I've said this to Deja before, because she's considerably younger than me. Deja's 30 years old, and I'm 63. I mean, I'm way older than her. But it's divisible almost. You, you know, you know what? It's not um um she's an old soul, like she really knows her stuff and um, uh, and our interests are very, very similar for what we mm -hmm. want out of life. Um, I wouldn't have expected to have a child um, at my age, but she really wanted to, Aww. and I wanted to give her what she wanted. So, um, um, and now I'm, I'm just, I'm in full on. I mean, so here's a question. Does your family still come to your weddings or do they just send a card at this point? Um, no, they, they, they send an email. <laughs> okay. They send, um, they, they send an email, but uh, the okay. wedding was, I had never gotten had a wedding wedding really in my previous there were always like a justice of the peace or whatever it was so we went to italy um we went to a, a little town called iglesias um and in iglesias i was there with uh franco colombo the the italian famous bodybuilder that discovered arnold schwarzenegger arnold actually called me and asked me to do this movie for franco he was directing called ancient warriors so i i lived and didn't leave italy for a long time almost a year um <clears throat> and so I knew the people of Iglesias 20 something years ago. This movie's in the 90s. Wow. Well, when the mayor of the town found out that I was coming there to get married, he said, I would love to perform the ceremony in this town quad, you know, around these beautiful old buildings in this church and everything. So we got the big dress and the makeup artist and the hair person, and like 2,000 people showed up. I mean, it was huge. That's magical. Yeah, it was, it was, it was it. literally a Cinderella. Like I could not have given her something more special than what we did it was yeah. it was really like out of a book wow, you know, so wow. it was amazing yeah, yeah gonna have, so. you're gonna have to throw up pictures at some point oh yeah yeah I'm, I'm definitely gonna i should send benny so he can uh he can post uh pictures while we're here so um, speaking of benny posting pictures do you want to get into the news i want to talk about i heard you on the phone when you came in about a dream you had oh okay <laughs> that i gave you every opportunity to segue into <laughs> I was trying to avoid it because I guess it was a, it must have been a dream. I'm a little out of sorts today because at four in the morning, I woke with a start to a woman saying like, 
Oh my God. And like sex, like slappy noises, slappy noises. Can, okay, and I'm can like, I, what's going on? Right. So, so now this can obviously, you know, it's, it's your house, right? I mean, yeah. so, so, so we're not in an yeah, apartment it's, or a it's condo. Very isolated. That we would hear. It's very isolated. And um, coincidentally, you shared with me that your friend is staying at the house. My best friend now, has been staying with us. For where's a few your husband months. while this happens? Not in bed with me. Oh no! He apparently fell asleep out on the couch, which he does sometimes. <clears throat> okay, so I get up to investigate, and he's going into the bathroom, and there's no more noises. So I'm like, I ask him, "Is Joey here? This guy that my roommate's been dating?" And he's like, I have no idea. I, I just woke up. I'm like, I just woke up to sex noises. He's like, no, I, 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 that's not what woke me up. I didn't hear anything. So, like, I trust both of them implicitly. I love them both dearly. I don't think Katie would be attracted to my husband. He, He's much older, but, you know, and he's got swag, but um so wait so wait, let me just get this straight there's you there's your husband then there's a roommate and a friend or there's no the roommate is my friend i see okay and she has this guy over sometimes so this morning when i woke up i was about to head out and i'm like did joey come over last night no and she's like no but i had this she had this dream that she was in this orgy and i'm like maybe she was did you wake up saying oh my god Wow. And she's like, maybe. So I don't know if I had a dream, she had a dream, or the two people I love most in my life had sex with each other. I think it's probably not the last one, but I could not sleep for the rest of the night. So I've been up since four, stressing out at how weird the whole situation was. The old orgy, I was screaming out dream story. I like it, ladies and gentlemen. Can we it's, get a... <sighs> It nice. sounds shady, doesn't it? It sounds um, really shady. Well, I mean, listen. <laughs> you I know, think they just said, "Yeah, it sounds shady." You know, you know, you know your husband, and that he would or wouldn't do something, or he would be that type. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rest on. It's one of those weird things that, and I'm sure he didn't. Um, but I, I've had a few of those where you know, like something happened, and then I found out something happened. Oh um, yeah, no. And if that happens, you know, I go and get a condo, and I, uh, you know. So, so you're not as California as you represent yourself. Like, like the the, the line in the sand would be if he did that. You know, or what? sharing is caring. <laughs> <laughs> we he has been poly before. I never have, and it would be a line in the sand because of lying to me. Mm. If you mm. said like, if there came to me like, hey Jamie, we'd like to sleep together, I probably wouldn't be into it. But I'd appreciate the honesty. <laughs> and maybe I'd be like, go ahead, Katie, take them for a spin. You know, it's that's, a good ride. And there lies that <laughs> uh that that thing we were talking about about um my wife and I. We um we spelled it right out. You know, we were like, listen, you know, things can change, things can happen, things, many, many things that I would be willing to work out with you or whatever. But we both unanimously, if you ever fooled around on me you don't get the baby and you're out the door either one of us you know so that would yeah. be that would be a one time thing i would still love her i would still be mm -hmm. madly in love with her but i would be gone the next day i pack my thing yeah. or or pack hers to leave no i pretty much feel the same way yeah that would be yeah. that would be Just, and, and for her too and you know and so yeah. she sees um you know baldwin and actresses and blah blah and she's like i don't care what the story is there's one rule you know the rule and what was great, the caveat that was in that deal we made was um, the person that fools around loses the rights to our child. So that's a huge, Like you know, full cussy? Like, uh, well, I'm sure, you know, I mean, l let's face it. If one of us was stupid enough to ruin the best relationship of our mm. lifetime, um, uh, no, I mean, obviously she would still see her son. And right, blah, right. But, uh, you know, she's like a smoking hot attorney you know she's a catch i'm yeah. an old, i'm an old guy now you're a so catch she too, has many Daniel. more she has many more you know, and, and she's very um um 
she doesn't think that way, you know. So when I, when I see the young hot attorney goes, well, maybe we should have lunch and, and discuss this. And, blah, and she goes, lunch is great. What time? You know, she's very mechanical that way because right. she doesn't think about him as being an attractive or a catcher. Right. She's thinking about she's the business in, and her job. She's in so, love with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no question about that. But I know how men think, and I know that when she walks in with the tight outfit on, I'm like. I know if I was a lawyer, what I'd be thinking, yeah, we should definitely talk about the uh, Zimbardo case. It needs your <laughs> personal attention. So do you get jealous? Are you weird about it? Um, Don't be weird about it. No, that, I'm not. That I'm, just I'm, pushes people away. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not weird yeah. about it. I, I actually have her back. Um, we work together real, as a good team. Like she'll start to feel, because she's a mom and a young mom, and she'll say, she'll say things like, uh, well, I feel bad. I should probably stop now. But I'm like, do me a favor. Finish everything you have to do. Um, because I'd rather have you done and then I have your undivided attention than to have you for an hour because she's very, very conscientious about her job and very, very conscientious about having a mom. And those two things come a lot of times before me, you know, and not by um, like she's not attentive to me, sure. but um, because the pressure and, I, and I'm accepting of it. You know, I mean, I realize where we're going. We're looking to buy, uh, you know, a nice home right now here. It would, oh, cool. it would be another, you know, another buy for us and you know so do we stay here do we go somewhere where it's like i'm shocked by the weather here shocked i i, I thought i was moving one state north of florida and it was going to oh, be really warm so you don't like the cold well no i came from the cold but i thought when i i mean you don't know what cold is down here i came from syracuse for God's oh sake. gosh snow torture. came up to your yeah. neck you know but but i was looking for and i just assumed for some reason that because i was just north of florida it was 75 eight months out of the year okay. the sun was out about and it's not it rained all summer long it was you know wasn't very nice it's cold now and i'm thinking let's go back to southern california you know or let's really? go well i just want to go somewhere where it's nice out I, I like north carolina quite a bit too and south carolina the carolinas are nice but it's not like that's the the uh, um the armpit of the entertainment business either. Atlanta has a, a, a big, a big presence right now. And, and, and there's a lot of excitement around it. That's what I like about it. Everyone's jaded about the entertainment business in LA, whereas here it's new, it's fresh, it's exciting. There's a lot of creativity. It really opened me up creative creatively. That's what I love about it. I got tired of LA because it was, um, all people did was talked about about the entertainment business. Yes. I, I, I found solace in being in Malibu. I liked Malibu because it was so far away from everything, the beach, the, the, the sea. and um, But it was full of people that were from Malibu, you know, and, and, and a lot of people <laughs> in Malibu are in the entertainment business. Right. So if I had to hear one more time about the movie that was being made and how they're, you know, they're this close and they just need, you know, and mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I want to talk about my kids' baseball team. You know, I want to talk about... So um, I didn't find that a lot out there. I, I found a lot of stuff about the entertainment business and I was tired of it, you know, hundred and something movies later. And I was like, I'm out. So I don't know. And the, you came here to direct a movie, right? That's why you initially came here. I came here to, to, to direct a film. My kids, my mom, we moved to Syracuse to be closer to my mom. My mom passed away finally. And then um, one child was going into junior high school and one was going into high school. And I thought if I'm ever going to go, it's now, you know, and, uh, and and oddly, after my mother died, there was kind of this weird realignment that happened with my siblings. It was very strange. Like I, um, I, I didn't realize how much of an anchor my mother was to mm. um, keeping lines of communication open. And um, you know, I, I don't talk to my sister Beth very much anymore. And oh. and I was kind of close to her. You know, I mean, we had some differences of opinion, but certainly not anything in my opinion that would stop me from being, you know, her her neighbor, her brother. But, doesn't, doesn't doesn't call me. Doesn't talk to me. Doesn't. Anything. Oh, that's a my, shame. Alec, the same way. Yeah, Alec, the same way. We were involved in a couple of real estate things together. One in particular, and mom passed, and he he's, he called me up. He he's very kind of mechanical too, in, in his uh, disposition on things. And he called me up, and he said, uh, "I just want you to know that you know mom is gone, and uh, I'm kind of really rethinking my relationships with certain people in the family." And, oh. and so I said to him, "I go." Well, what would that have to do with me? Because for he and I, we had a strained relationship from the time I was like in high schoolish, um, you know, on, you know, for, and, and my addiction played a big role in that. You know, sure. I, I really, I think he just got tired of my inability to get sober 
and you know crashed relationships with with women and children and you know and i he he didn't really do a lot you know he didn't have a lot to do with me during that time but i i never really thought that it was something he and he said to me years later he said of course i had nothing to do with you i'm sober and so why would i have right. anything to do with someone who drinks and uses cocaine and i went oh wow you know he he kind of i thought it was he abandoned me and he was an ass and he was a, he wasn't he was protecting his sobriety and so i never really thought wow he was stronger than i was he was able to put his sobriety before his own relationship with his brother um that's not the case now and and so to watch um that relationship kind of go away like my wife doesn't know him at all and yeah. and my uh um, and my children who know him very well you know uncle alec and blah blah, blah no more exposure to him well you've all. certainly done your penance i mean I don't know. I know this incident happened with him, this sad incident, uh, accident on his set. And I think that has uh, affected him. Um, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine it didn't. Uh, I try to be as supportive as I could during it. But, uh, you know, I think God has a has a plan, you know, for me. Um, I mean, that's uh, um, how I look at it. So I think that um, those things happen. There's that great line from, um, 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 what's his name? He's... Uh, He's a big producer, Pe Tyler Perry. Um, mm -hmm. You know that one about the rocket boosters? No. Oh, my God. We got to pull that up. Um, Benny, see if you can pull up the thing that Tyler Perry says about. Um, it's called uh, Relationships for a Season or something like that. He, he's giving a speech at like a church. Or like people come into your life for a season. He said, you know, reason. not all relationships yeah. are, are for a lifetime. Some are just for a season. I, and I'm paraphrasing. Some are just for a season. He said, you know, and, and, and don't feel bad about those people when they're just for a season he goes you know it's like rocket boosters you know a rocket goes up and it has boosters that take it as far as they can go and then they fall off to guide the rocket from going up so um um you know and 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 that doesn't mean that the that those rockets those boosters are bad people it just means that those rocket boosters aren't meant to go to the altitude that you're going to they're not meant to go to where you're going to uh, so don't feel bad about them when you do you have it you want to play it are we going to pull it up? Is it happening? Look at that. Good work. Look at these guys. Well, we're on there. We're looking like we're going to play it. Let's see if we get is, is that John down there waiting for us? What time is it? Johnny Ash comes on in three minutes. Okay. Hi, John. Can you hear us? Johnny. <laughs> Johnny's in uh, Colorado. He's another guy. I want to hear got, about that. He, yeah. got out, he got out of LA and he's got his own whole own thing going. He's been there for a long time. There's a diaspora. Which means we he's escaped. two hours earlier. We got his ass up early. <laughs> oh, gosh. And he's like, yeah, Baldwin, I'll do your show. But, uh, you know, 730, really? But not my fault, You have Johnny. to bring, bring the coffee. Bring All right, we're caffeine. not going to play Tyler Perry, are we? Are we playing it? Well, you you kind of encapsulated what he said there. So. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean, there, there's uh, um, I don't feel bad about those relationships anymore. You know, I mean, I I miss my brother. I love my brother. I love my sister. But you know, so there, there you go. I'm I'm going to places that I don't know they're going to go to with me anyway. Yeah, you, you know? keep knocking on doors. You can't. You know, you'll hurt your knuckles eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so John, Johnny's there. You want to bring you want to bring Johnny in? Let's bring Johnny in. Why are we making him wait? Sex noises get me up in? at 4 a.m. <laughs> Are we in with Johnny? Looks uh, like Johnny Ashton, what's going on, brother? Hi, am I on? You are on, bro. Oh, how you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to wake up here. So you I'm, having some coffee? Uh, got it right here. Right here, bro. Cheers. I knew, I knew cheers. You were. Is nice that one of those you. Starbucks city mugs? Yeah, it's a Starbucks New York mug. New York mug. I have a collection of those, the black and white ones. Yeah, like like a lot of them, like really? from all of them, probably 40, oh, that's 50. Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the black and I'm going to send you a black and white New York. It's got a little yellow taxi cab on it. They're different. They're they're. I got, um, that, one. I got that one. Got too. that one. Oh, I love that one. <laughs> I love that one. I love the cab in it. Um, so Johnny, I don't know if you realize. So how many? I, we were talking about this earlier. I don't know how long you've been on, but <clears throat> how many of the Beverly? Wasn't there a Beverly Hills Cop that like they strung you out for a long time? on the contract or something, and you ended up not doing one of them? I didn't do three. Three, that was did, right, it was three. I did one and two. Uh, they wanted me to do three. Right. Uh, I wasn't happy with the script. Uh, they kept uh, you know, negotiating, they wanted me to do it. 
And John Landis kept saying, well, the script's going to change, and it never did. And then they didn't know when they were going to shoot. And one thing led to another. And then I got offered a little big league uh, to shoot that in Minneapolis. So I took that job. And then uh, John freaked out and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to work. <laughs> so uh, they still tried to get me to do it, but I couldn't work out the, the timing and all that stuff. And uh, anyway, uh, this one, I love the script and, uh, you know, every, everybody's back and everybody's together and, uh, we got a great guest cast, uh, um, uh, Kevin Bacon. Uh, we, it, it's going to be, it, this one's going to be good. It's going to be really good. That's exciting. Man. So That's, fun, yeah. So Eddie is in, so these guys that are in one, two, and four would be the group of guys that you've worked with the most in your career, three movies. Yeah, yeah. We got the, the whole team back. We got Paul Reiser back. We got Bronson Pinchot back. Uh uh, wow. myself and judge and Eddie and the whole crew. Uh, um, like I said, and you know, Kevin Bacon's one of the guests on it now, and he's a Beverly Hills cop. And, uh, I, I don't know how much I, you know, I really don't know how much I can talk about it. I've got, uh, you know, that, uh, clause in my contract that, uh, you know, uh, non-disclosure non-disclosure <laughs> stuff, but, but now that the strike is over, I think I can talk about it, but, uh, but I, I I did a little ADR on it down in Boulder, so I saw uh, some of it, and it looks fantastic. And Mark mm -hmm. Malloy, the director, he's a new feature director from Australia. He's, he's great. And, um, I mean, you know, Jerry Bruckheimer was back. See, Jerry Bruckheimer wasn't, wasn't producing three either. So, you know, and Jerry and I get along great, and uh, Jerry's a fantastic producer, and he does it right. And he's back on four, and he's he he did it right. So I love, him. I love yeah, him. Jerry's great. I miss Simpson. He was he was the, he was the wild card in that team. I oh, him. Don Don was I, I love Don. Don and I got along great. I love Don. He was, he was a wild man. He was yeah, a wild man. me imagine me, him, uh, Dana Carvey, John Lovitz, and DB Sweeney in Vegas trying to close a deal up. Oh, for a weekend, <laughs> and since is trying to impress everybody to close the deal to get us all to do this movie, and it was just sounds debauchery. It was ba it was Babylonian. It was Babylonian. <laughs> so the answer is no. Three movies with Eddie, three movies with all those guys is not your record for an actor that you've acted with the most. It was a gotcha question. Four films you and I have done together. Four. Yes. So you and I have done four movies together. I challenge anyone else to say they've worked with the great John Ashton on four or more. <laughs> I have that distinction. <laughs> so, so John, we were talking um, um, about the strike has been uh, settled. Yeah. Um, as as oh. I predicted and, and Jamie predicted, I don't think it was a great deal. I don't. I think that AI wise, we're going to get screwed. A lot of people are talking about voting no. Which really? Is, yeah. yeah. I haven't seen all the uh, the ins and outs of it. Have you? Have you read the kind of the what was settled for? Well, yeah, or the memorandum. I, I, I think I think um, a big part of it, John, is for a for the extras. They and evidently in perpetuity they can make your image and use you, and you don't get squat for it. Um, no, I, I think they have to get your mm -hmm. consent, and they compensate you. Right, some but, nominal amount of money. Right, right. Nothing yeah, compared well, to if they showed up. Originally, it was something like uh, they gave you a hundred bucks or something, and they could use your likeness in forever, you know, or something like that. Right. But I mean, remember for those guys, and I've always said the union is really more for those types, the entry level. The, the union's never done anything for me besides count my residuals for 30 years now. Um, I, I can't think of really much that they're worth to me. They get you your meal penalties. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They don't feed us on time. The one thing the union did that really upset me was dur during the pandemic, they raised the minimum for uh, health insurance to twenty six thousand dollars. Right. Yes. Only only eighty six percent, eighty six percent of the actors in the union don't qualify for health insurance. Yes. Well, That's here's unbelievable. One. That's just and, and agent service. We we used to only have to make what fourteen to seventeen thousand for agent service. If you had 10 years logged on, I think we talked about this before. Yeah. So if you had 10 years, which all of us qualify of being members, you only had to make 14,000 and, and they, and they allowed because you've been a 10 year member, it wasn't 26, it was only 14. They dropped that. 
So, so what that did was there's actually been since being a new father and, and moving to New York to be around my mother, um, I owned a lot of my own stuff. I started making my own films and, and then I jump in and do, you know, so there was two years where I didn't make the 26,000. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. I made way more than that in my total income, but that wasn't for SAG related stuff. It was other things that I did. So um, I, I then requalified, do you know that I got paid more than what, what you have to make the minimum last year. And I went and I said, okay, well now I'm having a baby and I'm going to qualify. I never got it. Never got my insurance cards have called three times. It was supposed to kick in in April. I have no, no one has called me back. No one. Once again, maybe they hear you talking smack about them. How am I talking smack? <laughs> I'm talking about the fact that they're not yeah. giving me my insurance. Yeah. You know, yeah. with, with, with not only that, residuals don't count as earnings now. That's crazy right. too. They really hurt their older members. Yeah, really. I mean, there's a lot of older members that, that re, they live off their residuals. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm not sure the direction they're going in, but I remember, I'll tell you really quickly because I want to get into your opinion about it more. But I remember I was on a film. I was on a TV series. I told you the story already, uh, Jamie. And I... Um, and it was a big number, you know, it was like when I was on TV and, you know, all the time and on a series. And so, you know, you'd be surprised how much that drives the value of you. We were uh, supposed to be in that series together, you know. Homicide? No way. Yes. I was cast in Homicide. Wow. What happened? My agent screwed the deal up. Wow. And they got Ned Beatty to do it instead. Wow. You'd have been great in that. I was originally cast in Ned Beatty's role. Wow. Uh, Bo Detective Bolander. Yeah. Side scoop. Yeah. Can't remember. Hell of a cast. Yafit Koto, yeah. uh yeah. Andre Brower, Melissa Leo. Mm. Um, I fired my agent right after that. Wow. <laughs> well, I will tell you. Um, <clears throat> so I get a movie. It's it's you know, high six figures. I'm 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 cresting that wave of being <laughs> on TV series. And the producer calls me up and says, You want the good news or the bad news? I said, Well, go ahead and give me the, the good news. He said, Well, the good news is we're still going. Um, but the bad news is we're not going until the middle of August. Now I'm back to shoot Homicide after Fourth of July, and I was supposed to shoot this movie in May. And I said, "No, you can't do that. I'm, 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 I'm on a TV series. I have to go back to work on the series in Baltimore." And he went, "Yeah, man, I'm sorry. We're gonna have to find somebody else to replace." I said, "You can't do that. I have a pay or play." So I go to the union, and I say, "You," and they go, "Yeah, we don't represent people for over fifty thousand dollars. You'll have to get your own lawyer and take care of it." I said, "You can't sag signatory." A production when I have a contract as a member of your unit, they said we don't represent anybody. And th and that day, I never voted again. I never had anything to do with SAG, none of it. Because if they're not going to represent me uh, on an issue that I have, and they're going to signature a, a, a film that is screwing one of their members out of a lot of money, and they're telling me I have to go get a lawyer and sue them, no, you should not give them their license to shoot because of this. Here's my contract, sign. They didn't care. They changed the they changed the title of the movie. They moved to Miami and they said, "See you later." It was same exact script, and the union would do nothing about it. And so, therefore, I have nothing to do with the union. Bye, <laughs> bye, Johnny. I want to ask you a question because you do something that I, is is a dream of mine. You're in Colorado. How long have you been there? I have been here since nine, 1993. Wow. How, how do you work? as often as you work and in the things that you get to do and, and live in Colorado. Cause I keep getting pulled back to either New York, now Atlanta, LA, because it's so hard to be out of town. What's the recipe for success in that, John? Well, you know, I did fly back and forth for a while uh, because my agents and everything are still back there. But uh, you know, Danny, I, you know, I, I was living in Calabasas the last place I lived. And, and, uh, you know, I had been there for 25 years, you know, I went to school there. I got, I went to USC and got my degree in theater and I did a lot of theater in LA before I got into films and stuff. And, you know, my son was seven years old at the time and, and, uh, in 93 and, and the Calabasas was a very nice area, you know, and some poor kid got knifed to death at the, at the bus stop right down at the corner and, and it was, I'm supposed to be living in a decent area, you know, and I just said, I don't want my kid to grow up here. And uh, so I started thinking about places to go. I grew up in Connecticut and I was thinking of moving back there, but it was too long a commute to go to L.A. all the time. And uh, I found uh, this this town in Colorado through a celebrity golf tournament that I played in. 
And I said, hey, how about that place? So we came and found a house and uh, I moved here and my uh, raised my son here and he grew up here and and now he's back in L.A. working for a video game company. <laughs> so, I, so I bust his chops about it all the time. I said, I worked my butt off to get you out of here, and now you're back. And he says, Dad, I hate it here, but this is where my job is. So I said, well, that's the only reason most people live there. I got to big dog Johnny after he shot me down, so, so I got two quick golf stories. John and I are playing with uh, a tr another terrific actor, Tommy Bauer, and, um, and we're, on, we're on location in Toronto. Um, and then Hamilton kind of bouncing back and forth and the Canadian open is coming up. So <laughs> these two, these two go, you know, and I, and I want to impress, this is John Ashton and Tom. Sure, you know? So yeah. I want, I want John to go on movies and go get Baldwin. He's a good guy. So he says, Hey, we're going to go to the Canadian open. I said, let me take care of it. He said, what do you mean? I said, don't worry. I'll go. I, I, I got, I'll get an in. So we go, we roll up. You remember where we sat there? We are on the uh, overlooking 18, 18 you know, with, with at the where, where the finalists decided and blah, on the, you know, in, in the presidential cup, the premier of Canada, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there, I'm eating it all up. But the day before we played golf and this sandbagging liar turned around and made like, he, he, you know, well, I play a little bit, but he's going to tell me the same thing. Now I don't play much. I finally get a chance to close him and Bauer out. And I, I bomb my drive and I turn around, I put one probably, you know, 30 feet. I'm, I'm not expecting to make the putt, but I want to get it close to bit because he's off the green in two. He's, he's left two and then he's got three. He's hit to the back of the green. So he takes a, he's got like a wedge or some kind of iron in his hand. I'm like, he's not going to putt that. So I, I, I put it close. I drop it in to put the pressure on him. He's got to make the, and he chips it in from like 60 feet away he chips it in to tie the hole and i don't win the, i don't win the, the tournament against him uh, and i thought Son of a <laughs> so was that a fluke John, stole, or you stole the food from my, i was like this ready to bite it <laughs> stole it well, that was one of the best chips i've ever seen 60 foot and was it a fluke or are you a ringer did you it know was you? A it was lucky anything <laughs> anything 60 feet goes in is luck yeah, no, I don't know if I'm buying that. Hey, have you t seen Bauer talk to him? I did. Uh, you know, Ursula, his wife, passed away. I knew she was sick. I knew yeah, she, was she sick. passed away. Actually, while I was in L L.A. shooting Cop 4, and uh, I finished shooting, and uh, she, they had a memorial for her, and I stayed stayed over for the memorial, and uh, uh, it, it, was a, it was a nice thing. She, she was a terrific lady, and yeah, uh, I, ta I I talked to uh, Tommy uh, about a week or two ago, and uh, you know he he's doing okay. He's doing okay. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. That's tough when you when you're that close. They were very close. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She so, was yeah, yeah. I I thought I heard that, and I was going to call him. I didn't know Tom that well, um, so I wasn't sure if that was over. You know that that's that weird thing. Do I call and say, or leave him, write him a message or whatever? Um, I wasn't sure what to do in that because uh, we weren't, I don't, I don't know him that well. I know him, you know, through you and the boys doing the one movie with him. I think people always appreciate uh, hearing from people in times like that. Yeah. 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 Maybe that's the thing to do. Maybe I should yeah, drop, a, drop a line. What's next? What's going on next in the, in the wild world of Ashland? Well, I got two films out now. And uh, now that the strike is over, I can promote them a little bit. Uh, What's the other one? Two foot. Uh, there were two films I did last year before I did Cop Four. I uh, I did a film last spring called uh, Lonesome Soldier, and it's out now in theaters. Uh, and after that, I, in Chicago, I did uh, All Happy Families with Josh Radner, and uh, that that's out now. Well, it's actually in the film circuits, the uh, festival circuits. Uh, it opened. Oh, about three or four weeks ago at the Chicago Film Festival, and I couldn't go because the strike was on, and so I couldn't go. But uh, Rula Rose directed it, who I worked with on Once Upon a River, uh, which I love that movie. I'm very proud of that movie, and uh, and Rula is a terrific director. And uh, so she did this film and wanted me to do it. So I did All Happy Families in Chicago last summer. And then right from there, I went to L.A. and did Cop 4. So nice. uh, it was a pretty, pretty busy year last year. And so All Happy Families and Lonesome Soldier are out now. And uh, Cop 4, which is actually called Beverly Hills Cop Axel F, is going to be the title. And um, 
Uh, that's supposed to open now next year. When, when next year, I don't know. But uh, we finished it. I actually flew home a year ago this week. <laughs> so you it's, know, yeah, it's been done for wow, a year. Wow. <clears throat> the the algorithms, li literally, it's like, a, you know, an actuarial equation sometimes on, on how they overcomplicate. I remember I did, uh, me and James Woods did John Carpenter's Vampires. And they, they it was done. And, and you know, um, you know, Woods was pretty big at the time. Certainly he could carry a film with his name recognition. And, and Carpenter, who has his own built-in sure. following as a legend, probably the biggest horror director of our generation. Um, and, and he, they, they delayed and they weren't going to open. Then we were, you know, James had the, had the choice of East coast or West coast. Cause he was a bigger name than me. So he chose to stay home and do the West coast, which meant, you know, he was doing all the talk shows and all the stuff on the West coast. I had to go do Letterman and, and, and all that stuff on the East you coast. You had to do Letterman. Poor thing. He was a strange <laughs> Have you ever done Letterman? <laughs> Have you done Letterman, John? Me? No, no. He was. He was a strange guy. I could see that. He was a strange yeah, guy. So sense. either it was the most brilliant psychological move ever pulled on me before in the history of my career, or he's that odd. You ready? The lady walks up to me. She goes, now remember, David's going to come out from behind the desk. He's going to rate. He's going to shake your hand. Now, I'm not in my green room now. I'm ready to go on <laughs> as his first guest. So, uh, which is a, like a pecking order thing. You know, do you go on on sure. Wednesday as his first guest? Or do you go behind Madonna? And I, my, I'm, my ego's out of it. I want people to go see the movie. So I'll go on behind Madonna if more people are going to watch the show. How many people are going to stay up and say, oh, Daniel Baldwin's on. I got to watch him. You know, so so I, I, I'm going to go behind somebody. But no, they offered me to go out first, which I thought was really cool. And she says to me, she's like cleaning my jacket off. She goes, now David's going to walk out here and he's going to say this and blah, blah, and blah, blah. And I remember something. Whatever you do, don't touch David's neck. Whatever you do, put your hands on it. Don't come near it. Don't touch his neck. Have a great show. And she walked away and I went, don't touch his neck. Why is God saying what I touch? Him? And, and my next guest, you know, he starts to introduce me or my, my first guest. And I'm thinking to myself, don't touch his neck. And I, it was it, it was so mesmerizing for me to contemplate why she had to give me that direction that I, I was so tempted just to mess with him and grab his neck or, or like touch it really lightly just to oh, see if he boy. freaked out. Imp so, the perverse. So I, I lost all my fear about the fact that I'm doing Letterman and I walk out and he says, and we sit down and he sandbags me because I had gotten in trouble with me and a bunch of my friends at the Plaza Hotel and I got arrested. It was well documented. And this is the first publicity i'm doing since that incident uh, so i turn around and and he said he says that david society doesn't want to talk about that so i sit down and he goes hey so what the hell happened to pause hotel and he brings it up after promising he didn't want to talk about it ooh. and so i thought you ass. so i said you know i just fessed up i said i did it i got in trouble i was you know partying and blah 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 but what was really weird they went to commercial and he went <laughs> and i kind of looked over at him and he goes <laughs> and he's making these weird like guttural grunty and i and i looked at him and i, and I finally went are you all right and he goes <laughs> and he kept making these weird noises don't touch his neck he made the weird noises i was like is this guy out of it and, you know like what's the story and, and plus he screwed me by bringing that up so i never i was asked to do a show a few times for other i never went on a show again yeah, i just yeah. i just did conan and and leno um and i never did a show because I, I thought he was such a jerk but um, but yeah, the, the weird noises and touch his neck. I wanted such <laughs> Johnny, would you have grabbed his neck? Uh, if he if he had brought up a bad story about me, I probably yes. would. <laughs> see, I, I see if I was John Ashton, I could have been cool and just kind of reach over and like touch it. <laughs> just to see what he do. Because I think Johnny would have done it too. I know I blew it. I should have done it. I should have done it. Uh, well, I, I remember when the first cop came out in 84, I did Good Morning America and uh the judge and I were both on this on the show, and of course it was a you know a big hit at the time, and it was, it was Christmas time, and we were on Good Morning America, and and uh, right at the end of the interview, Joan London says, "Well, John, not bad for your first time out, huh?" And I looked at her and I said, "Yeah, I'm a 22 year overnight success." <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I just fell off the wagon and got lucky, but come on. Right. Well, Who was that they said that about? Uh, Kevin, uh, 
uh, um, Spacey when he did a usual suspects and he like won an Oscar and uh, they discovered him. But he goes, I've been doing this for a long time. Right. <laughs> you know, like, like just because this is something that clicked. Well, it was a funny, a funny story of how I got Beverly Hills Cop was uh, I did uh, True West, uh, Sam Shepard play. I don't, you probably know it, Dan. Sure. But yeah, uh, Ed Harris and I did it at uh, South Coast Rep in L.A. Oh. And uh, we both won Drama Critics Awards and all this stuff. And that was in 81. And uh, a couple of years later, I got a call and uh, to go have this meeting at Paramount. And I went in and the casting director was from New York. And she said, well, John, uh, I just want to tell you that there's nothing in this film for you. Uh, but I saw you and Ed do True West and I loved your performance and I just wanted to meet you. And and I said, well, thank you very much. And I kind of forgot about it. And a couple of weeks later, I get a call to go audition for Beverly Hills Cop. And uh, believe me, Taggart and Rosewood were very, very minor roles in the original script. And the original script, Mickey Rourke was supposed to do it. It was it was a very heavy film. And then it uh, then it switched to Sylvester Stallone, and he was going to do Rambo blows up Beverly Hills or something, and they, <laughs> they, they, they got rid of that idea. And then they got Eddie, and it became a comedy. And and uh, you know, Judge and I got lucky. They were pairing people actors together out in the hallway, and just happened by chance to put Judge and me together. And I had auditioned a couple of times already. And I only read the one scene every time uh, where I punch Eddie in the stomach and said, we don't want these loudmouth characters from out of town and blah, blah, blah. That's the only scene I read. So Judge came up to me and said, hey, man, we're going to audition together. And I said, OK, cool, man. And he says, uh, well, how would you like the script? And I said, I don't know. I didn't read the script. I just read this one scene. I have no idea what this movie's about. <laughs> so. He said, oh, my God, you know, and he starts hurriedly trying to tell me what the storyline is and all that. Oh I, said, I said, I oh, forget it, man. We'll just wing it. So, you know, we go into the office and, of course, there's 30 people in the office, you know, because uh, this was right down to the wire. This is like my fifth audition, you know. So anyway, uh, in the middle of the scene, I just said to the captain who wasn't Ronnie Cox, it was another actor. And I said, uh, I looked at Judge and I said, could you stand over there for a minute? I want to talk to the captain alone. So, you know, we're in the office, you know, so Judge kind of looked at me and backed off. And I looked at the captain and I said, uh, can I get another partner? Because this guy's a real pain in the ass. So <laughs> the whole room started laughing. And that's how I got the job, you know. Wow. So, uh, and they actually wrote that. They wrote that scene in the movie. And we had been on the film for a couple of months, and then uh, they we were going to do that scene. And and Marty Brest, who I love, he's my favorite director. I worked with him twice, and uh, on Midnight Run, he directed also. And and he he came up to me and he said, uh, "Hey man, do you really want to shoot this scene?" And I said, "Why?" And he said, "I love the fact that you just keep putting up with him, and you're like the harried husband, you know, and it's just you." And he said, I'm afraid you're going to look like a, a bad guy if you, you know, if you, we do this scene. What do you think? And I said, let's not shoot it. And we didn't shoot it. So, and I'm glad. So, um, but, you know, just interesting enough, Dan, I, when I was shooting Lonesome Soldier last year, these young kids that were playing, you know, soldiers in Iraq and stuff, uh, they're all asking me for advice, you know, uh, how do you, how, you know, can you give us some advice about the business and stuff like that? And I said, the one thing that really irritates me about the business now is I, I you know, I, I was doing theater and stuff and I, I got into television about 1972 or three, something like that. I graduated in 73 and I was like 25 years old. And, and uh, when I went into an office when I first started, I won the Drama Critics Award in 73 for a, a, a Fado French farce that I did. Uh, and I I got a call to go in to read for, for to play an ambulance attendant, you know, <laughs> some uh, two lines. But the director was in there. The writers were in there. The producers were in there. Now, and I, and, and, and 
that's the way it was. You had contact. You met people. If you didn't get that job, they they may later say, "Hey, maybe John would be good for this." Or blah 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 blah. Now you're on the phone doing your interviews. Yeah. And these poor kids, what chance do they have? I mean, the the technology and all this stuff has screwed this business up so bad. I think I, I you know. There's just no human contact anymore. There's no, you know, it, it just, it's just unbelievable. You know, yeah. I, I, I see these kids and they audition on a phone. Yeah, these people, you can't even go into an office now and meet people and talk to people and get some kind of relationship. Yeah. It's, it's sad. It's I, really agree. sad. I agree. And as I've spoken to, um, I said, you know, I'm not always 100% sure how good an actor I am. But one thing for sure, I own that room, those first the room. three minutes. Yeah. So by the time I'm ready to read it, they're praying, you know, and voting and rooting for me to, to be able to say the lines, you know, right. because they want me to get the part, you know, and they see it, you know, and, and, and I know how to play that game and, and, and work the room for sure. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a craft. Um, uh, it's funny that he said that because we were talking earlier and I said, um, have you ever been, intimidated in a room when you were reading like like a like like you messed it up because of because i got i wanted to tell you the story but have you ever what me have you ever walked in and it was you know uh uh cecil b DeMille, you know it was this one it was that one whoever it was that yeah. you just were like uh oh you know he's he's so big that every time let's <laughs> shoot <laughs> you read for stuff that 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 you know or, or do you have to read all the time or do they just offer it to you because you're John Ashton? No, I don't have to read. I, right. I didn't think so. I, I, that's one of the joys of living here, too. You know, I just, I, you know, I, I, I've done it. You know, I mean, I've done 50 films and been on stage and television. And my feeling is if you don't know my work by now, I don't want to work with you. Right. Sure. <laughs> sure. No, no, I get that. I get called and my agent says, um, <coughs> Steven Spielberg is requesting that you come in and read for this dinosaur movie called Jurassic Park. And I went, what? He said, Steven Spielberg is personally requesting that you come in. I don't know Steven Spielberg. I might have run into him at a function or something and said, hey, nice to meet you. He's Steven Spielberg. Who the hell am I? Sure. So um, I, we go to, I go to, I'm ready. I read the book twice. I'm you know, off page. I'm ready to go. It's Steven Spielberg. And... Uh, I can't try to remember who was the casting director, but she walks me in and it's at Amblin, which, and we're in this room that literally had 15 chairs on each side with a two lead, like King's chairs. And at the very end is Spielberg. And so I turn around, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm trying to keep my, my act together, but I mean, come on, you know? So I walk sure. in and I, he pushes the seat. He says, Daniel, nice to meet you. And blah, blah. Did you get a chance to read the book? He's going right into it. And I said, Yes, sir. I read. I read it twice. I read it again. You know, yesterday I knocked out the whole book, and he said, "Okay, well, you know, so you're the head paleontologist that Sam, uh, what, not Watterson, uh, Sam, uh, ah, anyway, Sam, Sam, whatever, got 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 the role eventually. So in the waiting room is my brother Billy, who I've never auditioned against, Ed Harris, and Sam. Um, so I'm thinking I'm reading against my brother Billy. I'm like. I mean, Alec, who was bigger than me career-wise at the time, and has always probably been bigger than me, um, I didn't really, I know I was mentioned at different times as Alec for roles, because we're so similar in how we look and talk, and but never Billy. Um, so I look at, across Billy, and I'm going in first. I sit down with him, and he says, do you have any questions after he asked me about the book and everything? And I said, I do, Stephen. I have to ask you a question. He said, okay. I said, why am I here? And he looked at me, and he said, I'm sorry? And I said, why am I here? <clears throat> and he said, well, um, I, I can't imagine it's rumored that you've spent $38 million on the dinosaurs already. I said, and I'm having a hard time believing that Warner Brothers is going to say, well, we could get, you know, Ed Harris, we could get da 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 da, or we could get Danny Baldwin to play the role. And I go, you know, he, goes, he goes, well, he goes, let me, let me, let me answer that for you. I am Steven Spielberg, and if I decide who I want to play the role, I'm pretty sure they're going to say yes. And I was like, ooh, touche, Steven. Ooh. <laughs> right? I mean, if he says, I want this guy, he said, but if you really want to know why you're here, 
He said, you did a Western called Ned Blessing His Life and Times that Bill Whitliff wrote. And I tried for the last 15 consecutive years to buy the rights to that because I wanted to do it as my next Raiders. I wanted to do a series of three or four films based on these beautiful sprawling stories. And Bill wouldn't sell it to me because he wanted to do it as a series. And he said he had over 100 stories to tell. So I kept offering him more money. It was like 2 million, 6 million, 10 million. And he would not sell it to me. So logically, when I saw that, you know, he made it finally the pilot, I watched it <clears throat> and I'm, I'm looking at him and I'm, I'm like, wow. Um, okay. So he goes, and I think you did an amazing, amazing job in the role. Very, very subtle. In fact, I think you're going to be the next Gary Cooper. Wow. So Steven Spielberg looks at me and says, I think that's not a bad thing to hear from Steven Spielberg. So I got to tell you, all I keep saying, I can hear in my head, I think you're going to be the next Gary Cooper. I Super think duper. I, I, I take the pages out. <laughs> and I can't remember a word of what I had, had off page memorized, every inflection. He's reading with me. He starts reading. He goes, you ready? And I said, yeah, yeah. So he starts, I get halfway down the first page and I go, I'm sorry, man, I got to stop. I said, do you mind if I go in the other room and we'll take somebody else and I need a little time with the material again? I don't tell them why, but I'm literally walking out thinking, you guys are dead. I'm the next Gary Cooper. <laughs> so I, down, I memorize it. I kill it when I go back in and read it. I didn't get it. Obviously, Sam, what is his name? He just came up the other day. My husband just Can said his Google name. Can we Google Sam? It begins with Neil. a Neil. Sam Neil. Sam Neil. Oh. Oh. Sam Neil. Do you know Sam Neil? Is he frozen? Johnny? Uh-oh. Oh. Oh, Do yeah. You know Sam Neil? I don't know him personally, no. Yeah. Okay, well, that's who we're talking about. So Sam Neill screwed me, stole my job. I'm the next Gary Cooper. And I was, next thing you know, a year later, I was doing tampon commercials. But anyway. <laughs> Male voiceover for tampon commercials? <laughs> they do. Ooh. Oh, that's disturbing. <laughs> Isn't it? I don't want men little, selling me my hygiene products. Why? <laughs> But see, I, that, I mean, you got to read with Spielberg. I mean, you know, that's I did. That's I did. And it, 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 listen, I'm, I'm, I'll take it with me. That was as close as I got. But he's one of those iconic guys that you just want to work with one time if you can, even if it's a small role. Oh, yeah. I, I did. Uh, uh, um, what's your favorite? So tell us your favorite. Do you have to go or are you good to stay for a little bit? Who, me? Yeah. Hey, you got me up at 630 this morning. I'm up. <laughs> I like it. I like it. We're gonna go, we're gonna go, we're gonna go. Are you gonna ask his favorite thing he's ever done? What's the favorite thing you uh, what what am I what am I, I your interpreter? Ask, no, I was gonna ask that too. Ask I, a I was question. Just reading your mind. No, I thought you were just gonna ask John that. Ashton, ask the question. Well, I really wanted to hear about Company of Angels. Um, because I was in the small theater scene in LA too. Did you hear about what happened with it? The equity shut down the 99 seat plan. So there's really? like no small company of angels i mean they get to exist still because they're membership companies but it's been made almost impossible to do small theater so i love that quote you said on the company of angels page that no matter how successful an actor is they need to go somewhere to work their craft to exercise themselves right i, did, like, a of, I did a lot of plays at company of angels yeah great company great yeah, company. that's why i won the drama critics award in 73 Wow. A flea in her ear, a Fado French parse. Well, it's very sad what's happened out there. And that's oh, one of the yeah. reasons I moved to Atlanta because there's more theater here. The small theater scene is right. near dead out there now. You know, and we did at the Company of Angels, we did the last meeting of the Knights of the White Magnolia, which is a Preston Jones uh, part of a trilogy. Uh, and we did it at the Company of Angels. And so many people came to see it and uh, moved it. And when we moved it to the Coronet Theater uh -huh. on La Cienega Boulevard, and it, sure. and we went equity with it, and uh, it ran for nine months. Uh, Harris Eulin directed it, and wow. uh, yeah, we had Dick O'Neill was in it, myself, and it was a great cast, and it ran for nine months. So uh, now I, I, that's another funny story. I like six months into the run, I'm like. You know, I'm bored with it really at that, that time. You know, I've done, I've tried to do that character every way I can. You know, right. anyway, um, so I start doing stuff. I swear to God, 
Harris Eulin sat in the lighting booth every night and saw every performance. Wow. Wow. Uh, he watched every performance and would give us notes. We're six months into a no. hit play. Six months into a hit play, and he's giving us notes all every night. So anyway, I I, I said, look, I need a break, Harris. I, I you know I, I got to get a you know a week off or something, you know. So I take a week off, and uh, we go out to the desert. My wife and I go out to the desert, and I go to this golf course, and I play. We play chess and sit by the fireplace. I relax. So after a week, I go back, and I was refreshed, and I did it. But I was a little worried that I was getting burned out after six months. But I, I, I read this thing about Laurence Olivier, and he said, after six months, you've, you've exhausted that character. So I thought, if Laurence Olivier feels that way, then I don't feel so bad. So anyway, I, I get a call to do some TV show or something, and, and I go into the interview, and all the people are in the room, and and uh, they said, John, we just want to let you know that uh, we saw your play and we thought you were terrific and wonderful. And uh, we wanted to call you in and we, we thought you were terrific in the play. And I said, well, I said, well, thank you. When did you see it? And they, they told me when they saw it. And I said, well, I'll tell my understudy that she really liked this performance. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <It's hysterical>. no. <laughs> and they all laughed and I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Do they still have, you know, you know, it's funny because the, uh, uh, when John makes reference to stuff he did in the theater in LA, I never found, I was in LA from like 90 to 2008, seven, yeah. so like in there. Um, and, and there really wasn't a significant, I remember they had just redone the Falcon theater. Is that still around? There was a huge theater yeah. scene. It was always swept under the rug. Everyone thinks New York is the theater place. Yeah. But there were actually more theaters in LA than anywhere in the country. Theaters that people were coming to, though, that were viable and, and, and like, like that were self sustaining for sure. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There were a lot of 99 seat theaters in LA. I yes. Was. And that well, contract is gone. I remember gone. Noah Wiley and uh, the Blank uh, Theater. Well, the, uh, well, they redid the Falcon Theater. Um, in Burbank, which was more than 99 seats. It was quite low. Oh, yeah. No, that's, yeah. And and uh, and to do that, they got actors that had, you know, some kind of name value. So they approached me and they, they offered me to do a one night only performance of George Firth's uh, Precious Sons. And I said, why would we do one, six weeks of rehearsal uh, for one night? I'm with you. Because we're selling the ticket for a really big number to raise money to refurbish like the $5 million refurbishment of this entire to head to toe. And I went, yeah, guys, I can't rehearse for six weeks and do this big long play. And only, I mean, do we have a chance to go to Broadway or are we taking it somewhere else? And not right now, but you know, that the, this is it. And the, and the play, I don't know if you know the play, but it's, uh, it's the husband and wife with two kids and they were in a Chicago apartment and it's just the husband and wife really. And so I, I knew Firth, he was a, great actor uh and, and playwright and i i'm a literally walking out the door and i went have you cast the wife and they said we have and i said who's playing the wife and they said annette benning whoa and i went right back in the room i went so annette <laughs> is signed to say that she's gonna do the she signed on her and i said okay i'm in i'm in and we'll rehearse six did weeks did you do it i did i said oh. just to work with her once wow um, yeah it was more of a reading than i mean but were they Cool. It was, uh, it was, yeah, man. She was just amazing. And he showed up, husband, Warren, uh, showed up <laughs> and he didn't, and I met him and knew him through Barbara Streisand about, and he didn't give me the time of day. He did not like me because we, me and Annette were, like, you had good were chemistry buds. Yeah, we had yeah. good chemistry. Not, not anything inappropriate, uh, but we got along and she liked me. I liked her. She'd show up with coffee for me. I'd show up with coffee for her. We'd text each other about, and he didn't like it. So he sh would show up, you know, at rehearsal unexpected. He was like, yeah, he was, he was interesting, man. He's he, just a you know, you know, it was really, it was really scary. Um, when Ed Harris and I did True West, it was in 1981. Um, I had heard the story because the original production was done in New York with Tommy Lee Jones and Peter Boyle. Huh. Wow. At, in the park. And Sam Shepard walked out on it. And he told Joe Papp, I'll never give you another one of my plays again. Whoa. So 
Eddie and I were doing the show in LA and it's closing weekend and it was a repertory theater. So no, and it was a huge hit. It was packed every night. And, and, but and when you're doing a repertory, they get another play coming in and no matter how successful the play is, they don't extend it because they got another show coming in. Anyway, Friday night, we were getting ready and they, they, they come backstage and they said, Sam is in the audience, Shepard. Wow. So Eddie and I go, oh, wow. You know, I mean, and it's kind of like you get on stage and it's like every time you said a line, it was like, <laughs> you want to look up and go, was that okay, Sam? That's how you wrote it, right? <laughs> so we find out after the show that he wasn't there. And we did a good show that night and he wasn't there. Oh, and ouch. So Saturday afternoon matinee, they say Sam's in the audience. So we freak out again and we, you know, but we did a good show. He wasn't there. Saturday night, same thing. Finally, Sunday night, closing night, closing performance. They said, Sam's here. And we went, yeah, 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 yeah. And they said, no, he's really here. We saw him. He is really here. So Eddie and I do the show. And I don't know if you know the show, but at the end, he, he wraps a phone cord around my neck. And and uh, we get in a fight and he puts a thing around my neck. And and uh, so we had it worked out where I could grab it and, and I could control it because Eddie's a strong dude, but he, you know, he is. <laughs> and so he could squeeze it as much as he wants because I could control it. Well, closing night, he gets it around my mouth instead oh, of around my neck. And he's behind me and he doesn't know that. Well, he tears my lip and it's <gasps> blood all over the place. And, and I'm trying to grab this thing and stuff. The show's over, Eddie and I are backstage, and Sam comes back to our dressing room. And he said, what a great performance. And he, I mean, Sam was so cool about it all. And he said, how did you guys do that every night with the lip thing? <laughs> 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 we didn't want to tell him it was an accident. So oh we go out and we drink beer and shoot pool till like 4 or 5 in the morning. It was, I mean, wow. was, Sam was great. He was great. So we were supposed to take that. They wanted us to take that show to New York. And John Malkovich and Gary Sinise were doing it in Chicago, and they beat us to New York. So we never got to New York. Uh, I saw it uh, in, what, late 90s with John C. Riley and Philip Seymour Hoffman, and they were trading roles. So I went to see it twice and saw yeah, it. I heard about that, yeah. It, it was phenomenal. Oh, they, that's cool. great. I met him. So I did a movie uh, called Grey Gardens based on the documentary, the famous documentary. Yeah, that was a great and, uh, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so my first day on set that I had to work with Jessica Lang, um, I said to her, I walked up to her and, you know, I mean, in my opinion, her and Meryl, you know, what I mean, like people will pick Meryl, but, but I, I'll put Jessica Lang's work up against Meryl Streep's any day. And so I walked up to her. I was smart. KG, KG, John, look, look out. <laughs> so I come over and I give her a hug and she had done streetcar on Broadway with Alec. Um, and so I said to her, I said, you know, now I get to knock another name off my list. And she looked at me and she said, I beg your pardon. I said, well, I have a list of actors and actresses that it wouldn't matter how much they paid me or how small the role was that I would show up just to say that I worked with them. And the female list is quite small compared to the male list, but you are definitely one of the actresses that it wouldn't have mattered that I'm not the lead in this film. I just wanted to be able to work with you. And so she gave me this huge hug and kissed on my neck and said to me, oh my God, that's the greatest compliment. And we just got along fantastically. Yeah. But she was with Sam. So, so you know, you, you get to the, the, the and, and he's a big fan of hers, obviously. So he, he'd show up from time to time. Is the male list still yeah. way bigger than the female list? Well, we've lost some of the guys. Um, yeah. Um, I don't, you know, I, it's funny. I don't, my kids bring up stuff. I don't follow it like I wouldn't know. Like my my one daughter, Avis, has this huge crush on the Chalamet guy. And so, yeah, you know. he doesn't do it for me. Yeah. And so, and so again, you know, I, you know, I watch a few things. We were in Italy. She had to go to the, the door of the building where people sign it. And she was just, we had to go to the lake where he said goodbye to the girl and whatever. The, oh my gosh. You know, so, so yeah, I mean. Uh, I don't know. And, and with the influencers things now, it's like, oh, you know, as a director, will you take so and so? He's got a huge following on blank. And I'll go, following it? What do you mean? You know, and so, you know, you got to sell tickets and you got to get people to watch the stuff. But, you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you. So the list, 
you know, guys like Brando are gone. You know, right. he was definitely on the list. Um, I know Bob De Niro, my, my favorite Bob De Niro. I've met him, you know, 10 times. I sat at an awards thing down in Tribeca with him. I walked to this table, big heavy hitters. It was Scorsese who was winning some awards. So it's Scorsese, uh, uh, Chris Walken, uh, De Niro, Joe Pesci, uh, Harvey Keitel. I mean, just you name it. And they're at this table. And they sit me at the table. I'm like, why am I at this table? I should be serving them drinks. So <laughs> so I'm sitting there with them and I'm, and I'm, and I'm listening to this whole thing. And, and I spent, you know, a couple hours at the table because, of course, Bob is there because of um, because of Marty. And um, now we're doing a, 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 a roast on Alec. And so it's me, Billy, De Niro, you know, people, Ireland, his daughter, and we're going to just crush Alec on, on one of these, you know, TV shows. And so we're getting all ready and everything. And after the show's on and Billy and I went up and, and then, you know, De Niro comes up, he sits down, president, uh, uh, Clinton shows up as a surprise guest and De Niro leans over to me and goes, Hey, 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 Danny, how you doing? I said, uh, you know, uh, Hey, you were funny. You were, uh, Says, are you an actor? And I looked at him and I said, <laughs> I've read in a room with him for movies he's in. I've Ouch. met him 10 times. And he Ouch. asked me if I'm an actor. And I, you know. <laughs> so again, he asked me this question and Billy's like trying not to laugh and everything. I said, so Billy goes, did you hear what he said, Billy? And I go, he insulted me a little bit. He insulted me just a little bit. <laughs> so I stole his line from uh, Goodfellas. He insulted me a little, a little bit. <laughs> so he said, no, I didn't mean anything. I'm sorry. You know, but I go, 155 films, Bob, 155 <laughs> movies, five TV series. <laughs> but no, 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 it's okay that you don't know any of my work. And I'm thinking, I've read, I've read four movies with him in the room. I guess he's he thought, got a lot on his mind. I think he thought Billy just got fatter or something, you know, and I'm not sure what he thought, but, but no, he didn't. Well, he didn't. Yeah, you know, speaking of De Niro, and I, and I, I learned something from him with this, uh, for Midnight Run, I was I was I was at a play to see Joey Pants do a play in L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, at intermission, a, a good friend of mine, Alan Vint, who's no longer with him, who is a terrific actor, but is he uh, Jesse Vint's brother? Yes, yes. God, Jesse's yes. one of my old friends. Yeah, Alan. Alan was terrific. And uh, anyway, he Alan came up to me at the during the intermission. He said, "We well, are doing uh, Midnight. You're doing Midnight Run, right?" And I said, I don't know. I never heard about it. You know, my cracker Jack agents, you know. So I said, I don't know. And he said, well, Marty Brest is directing it and you'd be perfect. You're perfect for it. So I said, well, okay. So I call my agents and they go, oh, yeah. You know, so anyway, I ended up calling Marty. I go, Marty, what's the deal with Midnight Run? And he goes, oh, man, you'd be great in it. You'd be terrific. So I'm waiting for him to, you know, give me the offer, you know. And he goes, well, you have to audition for it. I go, what the hell do I have to audition for you for, Marty? He goes, it's not me, it's De Niro. He wants to audition everybody, which is very smart because he wants to choose who he works with. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, that's cool, man. I'd love to work, uh, read with Bob. So I go to the audition, and there's 30 guys in the hallway reading for Dorfler, and they're all freaking out because they got to read with De Niro, and I couldn't wait to get in there. And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, I read the script, and I, I said, there's nobody getting this role but me. You know, and uh, I just I was I was so confident, you know, that, and I I couldn't wait to get in there. So I go in there, and you know, how nice to meet you, blah blah blah. And uh, and I know Marty did this on purpose. He said, "Hey, can you guys wait a minute? I got to go do something." And I know he left us in there alone just so we could talk a little bit. Yeah. So we he came back in, and George Gallo, the writer, and all these people come back in, and finally we do we do this thing and. And I'll try to clean clean it up for you. But uh, you know, we're doing this scene where I, I go to get the keys to the car. And I go, come on, Jack, give me the keys. So Bobby takes a book of matches and he goes to hand them to me. So I go to reach for him and he throws them on the floor and stares at me. And I look back up, up at him and I said, F you, man. And he goes, F you too. And I said, go F yourself, you know. And he, I know he wanted me to pick him up, and I wasn't going to pick him up, you know. Yeah. I mean, we did it in character, you know. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and then I heard, you know, George Gallo told me later, as soon as I walked out, he said, I want him. Mm -hmm. Because he wanted somebody to stand up to him, you know. That's right. You guys right. had great chemistry in that movie. Robin so Williams fun. did that. Robin Williams showed up. Levinson was good friends with him from Toys, but he showed up on the set of Homicide. We were all running around, act, young actors on a TV show, Robin Williams, you know, I mean, we had Oscar nominated winning guest stars. 
every single week on that show, you know, for the first season or so when Barry was was more affiliated with the show, was directing yeah. episodes. And uh and Robin Williams walked in and I remember he said uh he said something to me. I, I was the lead detective. His wife was killed right in front of him, whatever. And I'm just going to a quick synopsis. And so he's standing behind me. And I say, you know, why is it every witness doesn't know anything but the size of the gun? About, I'm going to make so much money in overtime. By, and he comes up behind me and he starts, I want him off the case. I don't want him around my wife's body. I don't, and he's supposed to be like kind of, a, it's written. He's in shock. And he's, you know, he starts getting a little louder. Well, we do the first take in the master. And he starts dropping the F-bomb you pussy you this you that I, 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 i'll kill you and i knew he was only doing it to see who would stand up to him and i stood right up and i said you know what you're in my house pal f you and i started screaming back at him they had to separate us i mean it was i thought he was going to swing at me i really did it was that close like spitting in each other's faces screaming at each other and of course you know tom fontana and levinson and all the people you know were like what's wrong with you that's robin i went i don't give a shit i live here this is my house. This is my, I'm on the show. I'm a series regular. He's not going to walk it. And I knew what he wanted. And as soon as they broke us up, he walked away. He went right behind the camera and he winked at me and he was like, okay. Uh, he knew who he wanted to see who he could swing with, you know, and the, and the rest of them were all cowering to him because they were afraid of him. Yeah. I mean, he's on my, he's in my backyard now, you know what I mean? So, and I stood up and we were fast friends, fast friends. I mean, yeah. That's great. Had, yeah. 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 You got it. Robin Williams is, was, a genius. I mean, he was a, the the funniest guy I ever met in my life. I mean, yeah, he was very talented. He was I very. Know, we, were like, in, we were at the, the Deauville Film Festival in France, and I happened to be in Paris shooting a film with Gerard Depardieu, and then they were opening Midnight Run at the Deauville Film Festival, and this was in '89. So I went to the festival. It was me and De Niro and Marty Brest, and and uh, we were at the hotel. And we were in the hotel bar, the lounge there, and they closed it to everybody else because people were all over there. They had glass windows all over, and there were crowds of people. And anyway, there was only me and De Niro and Marty and and Robin Williams and Tom Hanks, I think, was there, and just a few of us there. Robin Williams, you would say something, and he would pick up on it and do 15 minutes on it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The guy was a genius, I thought. I mean, it was, and then he, uh, his uh, girlfriend would hold his hand and he would shut up. He'd go, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and and then somebody would say something and it would spark him and he would go, another 15 minutes, he'd be off. And, oh, my God, it must have been exhausting. I had, I had two special moments with him. Um, after mm -hmm. the confrontation on set that night, um, I guess, you know, he asked and they just gave him my number and he called up. He said, I'm going to have dinner. A couple other cast members, Andre Brower and this one, and that one. And I said, no, bro, I'm not going to go to that. And he said, you, you know, no, come on, come on. Hang on. Today, today was just blowing off some steam. But I went, you know, bro, the entire piece, you and I are kind of ratcheted up and we don't like each other and you don't want me around. But I said, I don't want to mess with that. I want to do the episode. Good maybe, you, maybe, yeah. maybe sometime after, but no, I don't want to sit here and listen to Robin Williams stories. So the LA Times came and they did an interview because he was like uh, the second or third, you know, Wilford Brimley, this one, that one, you know, Elliot Gould and all these different like heavy hitters, like a Johnny level kind of guys like Ashton. And and so they were, they, they're asking me about Robin and they said, uh, what was it like to get to know Robin Williams? And no, they asked me, did you know Robin Williams? I said, I started as a stand up comedian. So I knew, I knew uh, Robin. Um, um, I knew him from, working at catch with me and Belzer wow. and working at the improv and in, in LA. And yeah, you didn't know that about I mean, me. That was you, new information. When you said, Oh, you're one of the funniest celebrities. I kind of laughed. I'm like, I was a standard comedian before you were born. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, and I said, my answer, um, was, does anybody get to know Robin Williams? And the reporter looked at me and I said, well, you know, he, he goes right into the characters and he does the impressions. He's John Wayne. He's a, a gay man. He's Mrs. Doubtfire. He's a, I said, you know, I think all of that's kind of his protective mechanism. Six months later, I'm at an art show. Um, I want to say it was on Wilshire at some, maybe the the, the big museum. And I was at a, at a function and he walked up to me and he just came up behind me, put his hand on my shoulder. He said, you were right. Mm. And I looked back at him and I said, hey, what's going on, man? He goes, I said, I was right. He goes, the article in the Times. And he walked away. That was Oof. it. 
so it was his protective mechanism. You know, Robin was a very, very intelligent. Go back and look at Awakenings and some of the roles he did that weren't comedic. He's brilliant. He was a brilliant actor. Mm -hmm. But um, I think he had almost like a social anxiety that allowed him to become really funny and, and outrageous. Um, Chris Farley was kind of like that. Whenever you saw Chris, he was on all the time. You know? uh, and when you tried to talk to him about meaningful, different stuff, I mean, I'm not going to put him in the same league as Robin Williams, but it was also just it reminded me when I would see him trying so hard for attention and be funny and be, and I thought, wonder what he really feels right now. Cause I was with him three days before he died with his brother doing an intervention on him, trying to get him to, to, to come. And he said, I'm just going to go to Chicago for a little while. And I said, if you go to Chicago, you won't make it. Wow. And he died three days later. They found him in his hallway. His brother yeah. That was a shame too. Terrible, terrible, funny, funny, lovely guy. Um, you know, but we just keep losing them. Um, I think uh, Dana Carvey's son um, accidental overdose yesterday. No. De Dex. Oh, that's so yeah. sad. Yeah, I reached, out, I reached out to Dana about it. I haven't heard back from him. It's, yeah, it's a terrible thing, this opioid thing. It's uh, it's awful. Um, we have just five minutes left. And so in the five minutes, we do a thing called Jamie's Jam. No, 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 no time. Are you not doing I, I want to show you something. I want to confront Daniel about something in the news. Have you, have you heard about this guy running for president in Argentina, Javier Malay? He's right wing. Yeah. Any vax and is is Benny there? Can he put up? Someone made an effigy of this guy, and I think you've got some explaining to do, Daniel. Wow, you think he looks like me? You don't. He's got Danny Baldwin eyes. He's got he's got Baldwini <laughs> eyes. But what's that thing on his? What, what's that herpes mark on his? On his? <laughs> Maybe that's just an excess of paper mache. <laughs> <laughs> he is anti-vax. So anti -vax. are you okay. moonlighting as a? future argentinian dictator i don't know man i mean uh i love <laughs> i love argentina though yeah i do love argentina i saw something happen in argentina that i've never seen i will never see again ever 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 i went down there i was in buenos Aires, and uh i'm in a bar and this girl maria comes walking up and maria's this beautiful girl and we're talking and she says oh i said my friends are coming and everything it was really nice to meet you and she was stunningly beautiful and she said, uh, uh, we'll be back here, me and my friends. You know, bring your friends tomorrow night. Blah. So I, I walk in with my friends into this bar. And um, I don't see this Maria girl. It's a club. And this other girl walks up with her friends. And they start talking. With and then Maria walks in. And Maria walks up and she goes, hey! and she's saying in Spanish. And she starts screaming at the girl that's talking to me. And next thing you know, like out of a movie, full con on contact, karate, like just start beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> punches her in the face and she goes back and she comes back and she kicks her she got all these these moves spinned roundhouse so the first girl ends up dropping the other girl and knocks her to the ground and they have this fight and i'm thinking where in the world are two beautiful women ever going to have a fist fight over me? <laughs> that is not great for your I, ego. I, I was that, I was ready I was ready for somebody to go, ah like and they punked me but no they they had, they had this big fight. Now, now I have Deasia, and Deasia, she would kick someone's ass though for me. I know for she you, would. yeah, sure. yeah. She's a little power pack. You haven't <laughs> met you haven't met my wife yet, Johnny. She's she's no, no. I saw a picture of her. That was it. You posted something on Facebook. Yeah, I was yeah. Like, shocked. I went, wait a minute, he's in Rome. Wait a minute, he's getting married. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> married, 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 married in Italy, baby. Come on. He done good. He done good. John, I have to tell you um, that. Uh, all the way back to uh, Midnight Run, where I first um, saw you. Uh, uh, one of my, I, I mean, here, let me let me make sure that you know that when I say, dun, 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 that's Daniel's hold music. This is my, yeah, that's my hold. Music. <laughs> do, 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 do. He comes with his own. He's auditioning, auditioning. I am, I'm, I'm, to be the I'm, voice I'm, of uh, Siri. Please hold. Yeah. For so the information so Daniel's looking find, for. I'm trying to find that um, in my phone, Da Vinci Code, you know, some of the Born Platoon, Snatch, there it is, um, um, that I have on my phone, Midnight Run. Um, it's one of my favorite all time films. Uh, I can go back and get acting lessons, uh, writing ideas, you know, just 
it takes me to a really grounded place. Um, the performances mm -hmm. in it are uh, just brilliant. It's a brilliant film. It really is. It's a brilliant yeah, movie. Man. You um, know, you know, George Gallo wrote a great script, and then you got Marty Brest directing it, who let us gave us the freedom to improvise on a great script. So you're starting mm -hmm. with a great script, and then you get the freedom to improvise and to embellish things. And I mean, there are a lot of things in the movie that were, you know, we just uh, ad libbed and stuff, but uh, I loved working on the film. We, we were on the film for six months. Wow. Uh, we started shooting in New York and literally worked our way across the country. And, and wow. uh, it was a working with Bobby and Chuck Groden and uh, everybody was, it was a great experience. It was a great experience. And, uh, and you know, Danny, you, you know this as an actor. There are some roles you you, you do, and, and you you kind of get a good feeling about them. And then there's other roles, and that's the way I felt about Dorfler. As much as I love playing Taggart in Beverly Hills Cop and a bunch of other stuff and True West and stuff like Dorfler, I just fell into that role. I mean, I didn't feel like I was acting at all. I mean, right. I, I mean, I I when I woke up in the morning, I was Dorfler. You know, mm -hmm. and I got a funny story, and I don't know if you've got enough time, but I we're gonna go. We're gonna go out on the story. Go. All right. Uh, uh, TJ was a, 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 a technical advisor on the film, and he was teaching Bobby and I how to pick locks uh, in between takes on the set. Well, after the, we we wrapped at seven o'clock, I had a seven o'clock call the next day, and uh, TJ said, "Let's go to Tony Roma's and and have a drink." And I said, "Okay." So we go to Tony Roma's. Well, he takes me all night to all these after hours places. <laughs> you know, he was a cop, you know, he was a technical advisor. So, I mean, I'm out till five o'clock in the morning with this guy and I got a seven o'clock call. And I said, TJ, just take me to my trailer. Just take me to the set. So he takes in. Now he can't get my door open and he's trying because it's locked. <laughs> so he breaks my door open and the door's hanging on the hinges. I go in, I go to bed in my, my bedroom. <laughs> And all of a sudden, two hours later, my walkie-talkie, I hear this, someone broke into John Ashton's trailer, and my trailer was surrounded by police and everything. <laughs> and this AD comes in and un un takes the covers off me, and he gets on the radio and goes, it's John, it's, it's Mr. Ashton. <laughs> so Marty comes up, and I said, go get me some breakfast or something, you know, so he, the kid goes, and I'm sitting in my underwear, sitting at my the kitchen table in my trailer and Marty comes in and he goes, get the camera. This is a perfect door for a shot. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, are you able to work? And I said, yeah, I can work. And he goes, you were out with TJ, weren't you? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I know how you feel. Wow. So it was unbelievable. But they, I mean, I got a million stories. I mean, it was such a great film to work on. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's one of my favorite, man. Hey, brother. Thank you for coming on the show. You know I love you. I wish we lived closer so I could see you. You too, I man. This, I hope this will be I, I, I love my promise to PG. I loved it. I Wasn't it ah, great? Thanks, bro. We got to talk about that sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will. We'll talk about it. Well, listen, if there's ever a cause or something you need me to come out and show that movie, I'll come do the Q&A for, for you or for whatever, you, whatever charity you need it done for. That's All right, cool, cool man. All right, brother, we love you. Thank you so much. John right, Ashton, everybody. Again. Thank you. Nice, nice meeting you. Meeting you. We will be uh, live again next Friday on the Daniel Baldwin Show with... Jamie Andrews. Boom. What's going on with my hair? I don't know. Are we still on? That's terrifying. We are still on. Oh, that's right. Hang on. Let me, let me comment oh, on okay. that. Uh, do do the whole like uh you know like whip it around and yeah oh my gosh I used to do a series of are we still on that never happens we're still on so we're still on yeah. no we're gone now so why are we still on we're gone now right no we're, we're still on oh, Benny's just <laughs> hanging us out to dry yeah Benny's Benny's definitely screwing us the show was so mesmerizing Benny fell asleep <laughs> I'm sorry you all had to see my hair like that it was very fuzzy I'm going to blame my four o'clock adventure, my 4 a.m. adventure with my okay, we're going out. We're, we're going out. We're going out. Okay. Bye. We're going out or out? <laughs> no, we're getting.